thanks for coming. I know you've been really busy, so welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, can I just say, I love Nevada County. Um, I really do. And um, I, I actually uh, was uh, just down in LA just a couple hours ago. Uh, flew into Sacramento, drove up to here. Uh, but earlier, uh, I had to ask Mary what day it was. Because uh, we, started, we started off this leg on Friday in Bakersfield. Um, and then drove to... Uh, uh, Long Beach first thing Saturday morning and then down to Costa Mesa Saturday afternoon and back up to LA on uh, last night and then flew out first thing this morning up to SAC and then drove from SAC uh, up here all because I love Nevada County. <laughs> I really do, and, and I'm so grateful for all of you all. I, when I come here, um, it feels like home, and I think part of that is because I grew up um, as a military kid, but um, Tennessee was home base for me. So when I come here, it just, um, it feels like home. And so I wanna thank all of you for being so gracious and, and inviting me back time and time again. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Itera and Justine for organizing today's event and all of the leadership uh, of uh, Indivisible Women of Nevada County for your work. Um, uh, our regional campaign director, Mary Moore. Um, yes. who is representing the Northern State, um, all of you for coming out. Um, I am I'm just so incredibly grateful. Um, as uh, many of you uh, remember, two years ago, I ran to be the chair of our California Democratic Party. Um, that time, our platform was really a platform on redefining what it meant to be a Democrat, because many of us believe that the Democratic Party as an institution and too many of our elected officials at the highest levels had forgotten what it meant to be a Democrat, uh, had in many ways uh, lost uh, their way. Uh, and so that, that uh, campaign was really about uh, getting us back uh, to basics. Uh, and really what that meant was regrounding and rerouting our party and people. Uh, it was a campaign that really talked about building a party of the people, by the people, for the people, um, and to get away um, from um, spending so much of our money on TV ads and on mailers and instead invest that money in people via community organizers. Um, and so that campaign really um, energized and inspired uh, folks not just across the, uh, the, the Golden State, but really across the country. And even though we ended up winning about 70%, of the elected delegation, because the California Democratic Party has its version of an electoral college uh, in the form of superdelegates, we ended up losing by 57 votes. Um, but that was then, and this is now. <laughs> and so today, however, the political environment is very different. And in fact, the reason why there is a special election for chair of the party is because our former chair had to resign because of sexual assault and sexual harassment accusations. Um, and so I have laid out four priorities that I will be focusing on over the next two years. First and foremost, priority number one is culture change and bringing the kind of culture change that needs to happen within our Democratic Party. Because, unfortunately, what happened with our chair, our former chair, um, is not an anomaly. It is something that had been going on for years. And it's not just going on at the state level, uh, it's also been going on at the local level. And so, really, in this moment where we find ourselves, with he who shall not be named who occupies the White House, <laughs> right? It is very important that we as Democrats be very clear about who we are, what we stand for, and what we are about. And so addressing the kind of toxic uh, uh, behavior and culture that has been going on in our party is really important to do, to distinguish ourselves from the other side. And I believe that culture change starts uh, with leadership at the top, setting the tone and the tenor uh, with respect to how we are expected to behave, not just as Democrats, but as human beings. And what kind of behavior will and will not be tolerated. Um, and so first and foremost, it's important that we um, make sure that all of those who, all of those victims who suffered abuse, 
at the hand of our former chair are made whole to the extent that we can. And then we need to put the systems and processes in place to ensure that that kind of abuse never again happens in the name of the Democratic Party. So priority number one, culture change. Number two, um, as you all know, we experienced incredible electoral wins. Uh, both legislatively and congressionally. Uh, I was just down uh, the other day at Costa Mesa's in Orange County. Orange is indeed the new blue. Uh, they are very excited about that. Um, but truth be told, uh, those wins were not because of uh, the local Democratic parties alone. It was because of the collaboration uh, between the local Democratic parties and all of the local on-the-ground organizing groups like Indivisible, like Swing Left, like Our Revolution, um, that came together to stitch together wins. And so we need to ensure that those wins uh, last November are not one-offs, that we can hold on to those in 2020, and that is going to require the uh, our uh, state Democratic Party really uh, giving the resources that each of those areas needs in order to, to make that happen. So priority number two is ensuring that we hold on to the electoral wins of 2018. Uh, number three, as you all know, we have now moved up our presidential primary to Super Tuesday. Um, and uh, that means that uh, every presidential campaign uh, and contender will come to the state of California. Uh, this time, yes. <laughs> you know, California has the nickname nationally as the ATM of the country. Uh, but this time, uh, they won't just be coming to California for money, they'll be coming here for votes. Um, and so it's important that the California Democratic Party, which will welcome in all of the presidential campaigns, has its house in order. Um, a big part of having our house in order is ensuring that we have a chair who is seen as independent and neutral. Because I will tell you that one of the things that, that, that really um, impacted 2016 was the um, belief, and, and quite honestly the truth, that in many respects uh, here in California nationally, um, it did not seem like it was a fair shake. And so having a chair who will ensure that every presidential campaign and contender who comes to California will be treated equally, that there is a fair uh, uh, level playing field, that there will be no uh, favoritism, there will be no putting your thumb on the scales, that each candidate will have the opportunity to, to make their cases to the voters. Um, and, and that is really important. And so we really need to take the lessons of 2016, ensure that we don't make those same mistakes, uh, and ensure that folks understand that they, they have a fair broker in the chair of the California Democratic Party. And then finally, um, as you all know, uh, California is a leader state. Um, as the fifth largest economy in the world, I like to say that here in California, we don't follow trends, we set the trends. And so we have an incredible opportunity to use all of the muscle and the heft and the might that is California to flex that, to help do our part to take back the White House in 2020. And what I mean by that is harnessing people, time, and money, and resources to help take back those states that we need to take back in order to win the Electoral College. So states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, Florida, Ohio, we have the opportunity here to harness the energy, the money, the people, the time in California to help take those states back. Um, that is what uh, I really want to focus on because California um, does set the trend uh, in many respects, not just here but nationally. And so I'm incredibly grateful uh, and excited for the opportunity in many respects for a second bite at the apple. Um, and I will tell you this. Um, I am going to depend very heavily on everybody, but especially women, uh, to really, really um, make the point of the need of women's leadership in this moment in time. Not just with respect to um, the chair position, but at every level. This moment really is beckoning and calling for women's leadership. And I think, you know, we saw the midterms 
where women really led those those gains that we uh, that we had. And so um, the uh, the women of this of this club, uh, I'm going to be calling on you to help us uh, as we move forward. Uh, and the men uh, who support us and who love us and who are clearly very smart, <laughs> we're going to be asking for your partnership and, and being allies in, in this. Um, I will say the biggest difference between the last campaign and this campaign. The last campaign we talked about some of the programming that we wanted to bring to the, to the party. This time around, we're actually going to give you a taste of some of the programming. We are, we are running through the course of the campaign three programmatic components. Uh, one of the programmatic components is a six week paid internship for Gen Z and millennials. Because we believe that it is um, past time that the party talk about the importance of investing in young people and put our money where our mouth is and actually start doing it. And so, yeah. And so on this campaign, uh, we will be launching um, at the end of this month um, that six week uh, a paid internship where uh, young folks between the ages of 16 and 35 can apply for the, for the fellowship. It's a $1,000 uh, uh, fellowship. It will be the six weeks leading into the convention, which is May 31st through June 2nd in San Francisco. And so they will be able to work on the campaign, learn about the party, learn about organizing, uh, learn about our issues, um, and actually get to experience a convention. So that's the first one. The second um, programmatic component we're running is um, a grant program. Uh, we are granting $50,000 uh, to the central committees and the organizing groups in those hotly contested uh, congressional and legislative areas, again, to uh, incentivize people to come together to stitch together a plan as to how they're going to hold on to their, those seats. And so that could be having a paid field director, a paid volunteer coordinator, whatever it is, they get to spend that money however they choose based on the plan that they put together. We're calling that hold the line. Um, and so that's the second uh, programmatic component. The third one um, is, um, we're doing so many great things. <laughs> It's, that's right. It's, it's, uh, the third component is a conversation series uh, that we are calling Leader of the Pack. And Leader of the Pack because California, we believe, should not just be leading on some of the issues, we should be leading on all of the issues. And so this is going to be uh, uh, four uh, conversations, one in each of the uh, four regions. We've divided the state broadly into the north, the bay, Central and the South in one conversation in each of those areas really talking about issues that a lot of folks will say are future issues We believe they are present issues. So issues like soil regeneration um, Issues like the future of work and how artificial intelligence and other things will will, will impact that we want to have those conversations now uh, because uh, California has the opportunity to not just spark these conversations, but to lead with respect to policy and legislation. Um, so super excited again about, about this campaign, about the kinds of things we are going to be doing on the campaign to give folks an idea of what we will be doing when we get to the party. Um, and I look forward to spending a lot of time uh, here uh, and, and, and across the rest of the state uh, as we look forward to really build a party that is not just an electoral powerhouse, uh, but a party that has real meaning and relevance in people's everyday lives. That, I believe, is one of the biggest opportunities we have in this moment, and connecting the dots for folks of why this party really matters, how politics touches every single aspect of your life, and how this party, this big institution of power and influence, uh, can help to bring people, connect people with the resources uh, to bring about better communities, uh, a better state, a better country, and a better world. So with that, I thank you so much. And um, I don't know what we're doing next, if we have, do we have questions or what. But yeah, so thank you, and we'll open it up for questions. Question for Kimberly. I'm going to head down the middle aisle. Go hit Sheila first. You may need to come to me. Okay. Hi, I was wondering if you could um, 
give us some ideas about how we can support candidates in our very red district and educate um, other Democrats in the state, maybe ones who have access to an ATM, to come and help us up here. Because um, we keep putting up great candidates, but we need more support. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, during the last campaign, we had a seven-point plan for getting the Democratic Party uh, back on track. And one of those uh, planks was to invest not just in our blue, safe, democratic uh, areas, but in our red, purple, and rural areas. Um, and so we uh, have not abandoned that plan. Uh, there are just some, some things that we need to focus on in these next two years, but intend to uh, definitely pick up where we left off with that. Uh, I was a big proponent of um, investing the time, the energy, the money, the resources to really build the infrastructure that is needed uh, in, in red areas and purple and rural and quite frankly in some of the blue areas as well. Um, and so um, what you can count on is someone who believes that every part of California, regardless of the color or the shade, is important. And this party should be investing in every part of, of California. You know, one of the things that I think we have a great opportunity to do is, is something that we did do a little bit in 2018, which I'd like to see us do for, for the 2020 presidential, but also just generally as a general approach, is to have, um, you know, we can call it adopt a county or sister districts, right, where the blue counties uh, can adopt a red or a purple or a rural uh, county um, and help uh, in, in the ways that they can, whether that be um, bringing people in, uh, doing phone banking, uh, sharing their, their time, their talent, their treasure, whatever that looks like, uh, to really sort of foster the, uh, the reality that we are one California, regardless of where we are in the state. And so uh, I'm all about fostering that. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, during my tenure at Emerge California was expanding the organization from a regional uh, program that serviced about eight or nine counties in the San Francisco Bay Area to a statewide program that now runs three programs, one in uh, Northern California, one in the Central Valley, and one in Southern California, um, with plans to have one that is truly Northern California up here uh, and then turn North Cal into the Bay Area. But one of the things that we did in that program was we, uh, the program participants had to go to the other parts of the state um, because it, it, we believe it's important for folks to understand that, um, you know, California is a big state, it's very diverse. Uh, all politics is local. What is good in the Bay Area is not good in the Central Valley, is not good in San Diego, which is in the South, but is very different from LA, right? So understanding and getting to know your neighborhood, we have a big neighborhood, this is a big state, but it's really important for us to do that. Um, and so I'm all about fostering that kind of collaboration and um, you know crossover in terms of our, our, our geography. Do you see um, any role for the CDP chair in furthering the greening of California and the work to um, curtail the effects of global climate change? Yeah. Uh, in a word, yes. <laughs> um, if you haven't already had a chance to check out my website, uh, which is voteforkimberly.org, we have an issues tab on there. I think there are probably 21 or 22 issues. One of them is the Green New Deal. Uh, I'm a big supporter of that. I especially appreciate the gender and racial um, aspects of uh, and considerations of the Green New Deal. Um, but again, in, in the spirit of sort of showing, in, in many ways, how this party can do more and be more and mean more in people's everyday lives, and how the, the party chair, as the official spokesperson of all California Democrats, can really help to elevate these issues and these conversations in a way that really helps to educate people, uh, to move us, and then to move our electeds. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're having the conversation series. Uh, right, I think uh, many of you know that soil regeneration, a lot of folks believe that that's a great opportunity to really have a big impact on, um, uh, on our, our carbon emissions. And so having those kinds of conversations, I think is really important. And that's one of the things that I, I hope to be able to do is to host these kinds of conversations and wherever they are in the state, 
We'll make sure that we have the technology, whether it be Facebook live streaming or recording them, so that wherever you are in the state, you'll be able to actually enjoy them and participate in them. So I do believe that um, as, as the chair of this party, um, there is an opportunity to do that. What I will say is this, historically, the chair of the party didn't do any of that, and in many ways was just a figurehead. And so in many ways, this is redefining what it means to be the chair of the largest, most powerful, most influential state party in the country. Now that is what leadership is, right? It means raising the bar and the expectations of what California Democrats should expect from their chair, right? You don't just sit and hold a position and a title, you use it to, to elevate and to bring this party up. And so, um, I, yes, the answer is yes, and. <laughs> Has the state electoral process changed for Chair? No. <laughs> so they haven't learned? <laughs> Not yet. There is an effort, actually, uh, that's under uh, underway right now to uh, require a third party, a third party a neutral independent agency come in and oversee the elections uh, of the party uh, officer. So, um, we won't get into we won't get into the past. Let us let me just say this: um, I believe in election integrity. I believe in transparency. I believe that as a party, we cannot hold the moral high ground and authority if we cannot ensure that our own internal elections are fair and clean and transparent. Okay. Regardless of what the outcome was last time, that was not the case. And so we have an opportunity this time to course correct. And again, this isn't just for us, but this is setting the example for the rest of the country uh, to follow. And again, when we think about who is in office now, okay, when we think about the, the real importance of distinguishing who we are from the other side, uh, there should be no reason why any elected official, why any delegate would not want to have an election for an internal uh, party uh, position, or plural, um, where everybody who votes or participates or, or, or witnesses has faith and trust that that was a fair and transparent process. So we are going to be advocating for that. You all can help by when you see the petitions and stuff going around calling on, on that. You can help by, by putting your support behind it. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you mean that the super delegates have not been eliminated. In, they haven't been eliminated. And um, is that what you're working on, eliminating the super delegates? And also, I wanted to know if you're if the Democratic platform is remaining the same. I understand it was quite progressive last, last time around. So the platform is in place, I believe, through 2020. Uh, so that is, um, and it's a very, very good uh, platform. Obviously, there's always room for improvement, and that is what we are in this to do, is to move the ball of progress forward um, as quickly, as fast, as effectively um, as we can. Um, but with respect to the process, um, superdelegates are still a, a part of the system, and it will be so until the, the delegation at large votes to change that. Um, what uh, what I'm talking about specifically is the um, the uh, election process itself, the registration, the credentialing, the uh, counting of the ballots. Uh, almost every single part of that election process um, was um, compromised, and so ensuring that the ballots are not in a room where only certain people have access to it and, and there are boxes of ballots coming in and going out. Um, making sure, uh, for example, this is a very big piece of it, a very big piece of it. We are still waiting the official delegate list from the party. We have still not been given the official delegate list. Once that delegate list is released, Per our bylaws, it is supposed to be locked. 
meaning it cannot change. The only changes that can happen to that delegate list is it can get smaller, meaning people get removed as delegates, but it cannot get larger. Big issue last time, the delegate list that we were given as the official list was not the same list that they used to count ballots. Okay. So, again, when we talk about our election integrity and our election processes, it's important that at every step of the way, there are independent validators who don't have personal stakes and interests in the outcome of elections um, to ensure the faith and the trust of the people who are part of it. That is, that is what I mean. Hi, Kimberly, thanks for coming to Atlanta County. Lori Watkins. Um, so last... Uh, were we just like, at a dinner together? Yes, we were. <laughs> Thank you for coming out here. Um, so last cycle, we had five Democrats running in this for congressional seat. Amazing. <laughs> we had five uh, Democrats running for that seat. I don't think that's happened ever here. And unfortunately, we didn't have a nominee that um, went to the convention um, because, and where I'm going with this is, I just hope that when you become chair, woman, that there is a lot more uh, communication and work done with the central committees to understand the process long before people even start filing to run and things like that. Because when you have five Democrats running and you have to get 50 plus one, it was very close between three of the women and nobody got it. So that doesn't really help our area and our seat and you know putting forth a Democrat when we can't even really be represented at the convention. So I hope when you're chairwoman, you come back here a lot because Audrey Denny is going to take this guy. <laughs> just over 10 points under beating this man. Yeah. And he continues to dig himself into a grave, this disgusting, despicable vote that he just took the other day, yeah. one of 23 members in Congress. People in his party didn't even vote for it. <laughs> and he can just keep doing these things that I truly believe will go against party values and lines in this district. Tax break that he voted for, that's affecting so many people in this district. So I just hope that you come back more and we can support her and we can get her um, to where she needs to be supported at the state level so we can get people to take this seat seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say this. Um, this was a part of the last platform, but it's something I will continue to talk about because um, I believe it to be true. There are still a lot of ways in which we need to democratize the Democratic Party. One of those ways is to really open this party up to the diverse perspectives and voices that are out there. I was down in uh, Orange County talking about some of the reforms that we need to happen in the party. And we got on the conversation of the ADEM elections, right? And the fact that, yes, we saw an incredible surge this last year and over the past couple years, actually since the 2017 chairs race, where the, um, the people who came out to vote, it, the, uh, it, it sort of exploded, right? It was usually these elections had 50, 60 people who actually came out and voted, and we saw in 2017 thousands of people coming out. So last time, um, I think earlier uh, in January, we had about 41,000 people come out, which was, you know, great. But there are 40 million Californians, right? And 9 million registered Democrats, right? So we need to do a better job of educating, right? Using this big institution to educate the general public about what this party does, the resources that it has, um, and these kinds of um, ADEM elections, the central committees, the places where you can go to plug in and participate. And so, um, you know, the answer is yes. Um, we need to be empowering uh, our central committees and our, and our local dem clubs. We need to be providing them with the resources, with the tools they need to connect, uh, whether that be in person or using the technology um, that we have. 
Um, but there is, again, more this party can be doing and should be doing um, in order to ensure that we as Democrats um, are, are as effective as we can in every part of the state. We did a much better job this year of getting the word out, but still we'd like to do a lot more and especially get some women of color in there to get to be ADEM uh, delegates. That's just an aside. But my question is, um, I think she sort of asked it, our difference between what we're doing and our platform, sounds like we're trying to move closer together on those two, what we're doing as a party and what the platform says we stand for, like racial justice, prison reform, and all those wonderful things. Um, my question is to you about this uh, upcoming um, election that you're gonna have. Um, how do you see yourself in position to these others? There's two other people running against you. There's somebody named Rusty and somebody named Zaraka. Is that, is that right? How do, you, um, how do you see that going? I mean, how do you, how do you assess what their skills are or what they're... Winning. Yeah. I yeah. see us winning. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let, me just, let me just answer it like this. When it comes to um, the chair of the California Democratic Party, I think it's really important that you understand, first and foremost, what is the role of the chair? Let's start there. The role of the chair is really threefold. First and foremost, they raise money for the party. It is the chair's responsibility to raise the operational and programmatic budget to keep the lights on and to keep the party running. First and foremost, gotta be able to raise money. Um, I don't know if you all uh, are on the email, but we uh, put a press release out just last week uh, that we surpassed our midway goal. We've raised over $350,000 uh, towards our $650,000 budget uh, last week. Um, but the chair has to be able to raise money, and as the executive director of Emerge California, uh, during my tenure uh, over the seven years, we quadrupled the budget uh, as the organization. I've raised millions of dollars. That was uh, my role, was development director in chief, the chief fundraiser for the organization. So number one, the chair of the party has to raise money. Uh, number two, the chair of the party is the official spokesperson for all California Democrats. They are the face, the soul, the spirit, if you will, of this party. Yay. They're the ones who represent you, represent you to the media, on TV, in the communities. They are the official spokesperson. Uh, and then thirdly, the chair of the party is the cheerleader in chief. Uh, they're the ones who go across the state to rally the troops, to bring people together, uh, to really um, you know, convene people around the issues that are important to Democrats. That is the role of the chair. And so when you think about the role, uh, think about the, the skill sets that are needed. Um, when it comes to the qualifications, you need someone who has a proven track record uh, of raising money, someone who has served as the official spokesperson of a statewide organization, and someone who uh, has helped to rally around the issue. Um, and, and with respect to Emerge California, our mission was getting Democratic women elected. And uh, for those of you who don't know the stats, Emerge California uh, in its 15 years has trained over 600 uh, women here in California. More than half of those women currently sit in elected office. Um, some of the more familiar names that you might recognize, the mayor of San Francisco, London Breed, is an Emerge California alum. The mayor of Oakland, Libby Schaff, is an Emerge California graduate. Malia Cohen, the first African-American woman to serve in the statewide board of equalization, Emerge California grad. And California's first female lieutenant governor, Eleni Kunalakis, is an Emerge California alum, right? So when you talk about running an effective program, uh, more than 72% of Emerge women who run the first time win, and 56% of Emerge California women uh, are women of color. And so someone who, you know, when you talk about, again, the chair, the role, what you're looking for, um, we are very, very uh, confident that we are the most qualified not person, most qualified person to serve as the head of the California Democratic Party. Yes, Heidi. Yes, Hi Heidi and 
Hillary, your, your local homegirl home heroes. Um, so when we looked at the last election and the issues that were created with Bernie and, and, and more national issues, and you're talking about integrity and um, um, transparency in the primary, do you have a role to play within the National Democratic Party that helps that integrity occur so we don't end up with all that, you know, contention that we ended up with after that, that election? Yeah. 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 I will say that even though we have a, a national um, uh, party, the DNC, again, I want to remind us of who we are. We are California. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. We, in many ways, set the tone and the direction not just for the rest of the country, but for the rest of the world. And so the answer to that is yes. We have an opportunity to have an outsized influence on um, how things go uh, across the country. And so um, for me, this really is about using this opportunity to encourage people to support your candidate, whoever that candidate is. We are incredibly fortunate to have a strong bench of qualified candidates uh, to, to serve as president. So encouraging folks to support your candidate and focus on your candidate as opposed to um, tearing down or talking bad about other candidates. Just focus on the positives of your candidates um, in an effort to keep the tone and the tenor and the vibration high um, that is really important, and that is something that the chair of this party can do, not after the primary when we're all bruised and bloody, right? <laughs> but along the way, helping to do that so that it creates a much easier environment once we get to uh, our primary and having to rally around who our nominee is. So um, that was a long way of saying yes. <laughs> women gatherings. And to be honest, last year, those of us who worked very hard on SB 562 um, felt kicked in the gut by the Democratic Party. I, I'm chair of the Nevada County chapter of Healthcare for All, and I spent a lot of time ranting, saying, if we had Kim Reels as the chair, this wouldn't have happened to us. <laughs> Well, I would have gone down kicking and screaming. <laughs> this year we don't even have a bill. Nobody had the guts to stay as a sponsor. We have a sponsor who backed out. We have national Medicare for all, but we do not have a California bill. So I just want to say, isn't it true that um, the support for single payer was in, is in the party path platform? Yeah, so I have confidence in you, unlimited confidence in you, but I just know that because you care about the people, that you will help, you, you won't block issues that the people need. And we need Medicare for all. Yes. 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 incredibly proud that I had the sole endorsement of the California Nurses Association uh, in the last campaign and, and, and campaigned. I was actually in Bakersfield, we were talking about it, I think probably 20 or 25 different uh, SB 562 rallies that we did along the campaign trail as well. So I was the, the biggest uh, 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 cheerleader uh, and supporter of, of that bill. Um, and what I will say is this, and this is one of the things that I shared with the folks in, in Bakersfield. Um, I want to remind us of where the power lies. The power does not lie in our elected officials. The power lies with the people. And unfortunately, um, this is one of the, and this is, again, you know, the last time around, one of the philosophies of the campaign was we were going to have the courage to facilitate difficult conversations and tell hard truths. And the hard truth of the matter is when you have a one-party uh, a, a one party state, too often our elected officials get to hide behind that letter, right? They don't have to demonstrate courage. When Democrats run the board, they don't have to, right? We have a super, super, super majority, right? So there's no reason why we shouldn't be advancing a lot of these things. 
We talk about wanting to get money out of politics, campaign finance reform. Well, we have the votes, right? We talk about wanting to be the environmental steward, or can we not just you know, regulate fracking? Can we ban fracking? Right? We talk about wanting to have, but can we just do it, right? So, so talking about the discrepancy, the gulf between what we say are our values and actually what is happening, that is where we come in, right? That is where you come in as the people, right? What we saw, you know, happen in 2018, and I like to say, you know, <laughs> I don't like to say this, but it is true. He who shall not be named, <laughs> did us a favor, he really did. Because what it has done, it is, has waken us up. Too many of us have been unconscious and asleep, and especially here in California, where we have a blue state, it's democratic, we just sort of, we take things for granted, and that is especially true in the Bay Area, uh, in, in LA, in some of these parts that are deep blue, we take things for granted and we forget. And so, if nothing else, it has awakened our consciousness. It has, it has made civic engagement cool again, right? People are coming out and, and understanding that the freedoms that we enjoy and have are because they are hard fought, right? That, that generations have been fighting for these freedoms that we enjoy today, and we have to continue to fight if we want to sustain them. And so um, all that to say, if we want Medicare for all, if we want campaign finance reform, if we want to finally get rid of fracking, if we want to pass the Green New Deal, the power is with you. Let your officials know what you want. That means postcard writing, that means showing up at their district offices, it means buses to the Capitol. Make your voices heard. There are more of us than there are. They serve at our pleasure. Let us not forget that. And so I'm gonna encourage us again, remember you have the power. And then nothing happens for, at the party after that. It's up to the people who sponsored the resolution to then organize their own little group to march down to Sacramento or wherever and start lobbying for it. There is no follow through at the CDP to even send that resolution to all of our democratic legislators. That's up to the group that is um, ma making the effort to, to uh, push forward an issue. And it just seems to me that this is a big thing that's just falling off the cliff here. We need more support on how to do that, not all of us know, um, and help from the uh, CDP, maybe not the staff, but the elected people, um, our officers, to help us do that um, and, and uh, do the education piece on how we need to do that and arrange meetings for us and be more of a lobbying group to get these things passed that are hard to do and that we don't necessarily know the connections. So um, anyway, that's one comment. The other thing is um, I would really hope that you would give a lot of emphasis to the rural areas um, you know, our red districts are the only place that the Democratic Party can grow in California, okay? We're covered everywhere else. So, um, you know, <laughs> for all of the previous uh, chair's many faults, um, he did provide more, um, more resources to the red areas than we've ever seen before 
in, from the CDP. And I didn't vote for that guy, which means I voted for you. But, <laughs> Uh, but we really did appreciate that, and that did help. So I hope that that kind of effort um, is maintained, and I appreciate um, the grant program that you just mentioned. Yeah. That sounds like a really good start. Yeah, thank you for that. So what I will say, two things start with the second point. Um, in the back, I think we have some materials there, the old materials from the last uh, campaign, but on, on uh, that card, it are the seven points from the seven point plan, including the investing in the red, uh, purple, and rural areas. Um, I believe in that deeply. And so you have my firm commitment um, that whatever the, uh, the resources and investments you got last time will not go down, they will only go up. Um, I plan to personally spend time in each of the areas. I am going to be the chair that rolls up her sleeves and digs in and is in the community. Um, uh, one of the things that we're planning to do, uh, because uh, as you may recall last campaign, it was a two-year endeavor for us. Um, I was able to visit 50 out of 58 of the counties. Um, this time around the runway is a little shorter. We have like three months now. <laughs> um, so um, in an effort to um, A, not turn me into a bobblehead, um, B, not just do sort of drive-bys where you're just, you know, in and out, meet and greets for 20 minutes and gone. Um, we have basically divided um, the time for the entire month of April and the first two weeks of May. Um, and each of the four regions, I am spending two weeks on the ground in each of the regions to be able to have these kinds of conversations, but also to learn about the specific issues in that region as we talk about how this party can be a resource to you to help us solve the issues in those specific uh, regions. Um, so uh, check the, the card in the back for, for the, the part specifically about the rural um, parts of the state. And then secondly, with respect to the party, again, I believe that this party um, should be a resource. Um, one of the reasons why we have our regional campaign directors is because, well, first of all, this state is way too big to have just one campaign manager. B, this state is very different, um, not just geographically, but politically and in terms of, of what the issues are. Um, but C, because we really want to change and reframe um, our approach with respect to what this party is here to do. This party is here to serve you. And so that, the, the, the model, the, the, the regional campaign directors uh, were there because we want to create a member services platform. The regional directors are here to serve you. This party is here to serve you. Um, and so I intend to do a, you know, sort of pop the hood, top to bottom assessment, uh, not just in terms of uh, the operations of the party, not just in terms of the staffing and what we are going to need in a team, when we look towards the next two years, but also how we can retool this party to be that 21st century party, to be able to provide the resources and connect the dots uh, for our, our uh, uh, members, for the central committees, for the clubs, um, and what have you. So uh, I am all about, um, you know, understanding that politics, or at least my definition of what politics is, is using all of the influence all of the resources, all of the money, uh, all of the power to do good and to help others. And that is what this Democratic Party should be doing, not just here in California, but across the country. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Kimberly. We really appreciate you coming.